Hey everybody, welcome to the Abroaders Travel Podcast, your weekly meetup with thousands of entrepreneurs, hustlers, creators, nomads, ninjas, wanderers, and world changers, all seeking to build the skills and connections to live a life without borders. If you want to learn more about what we do or download our entire podcast archive, check out the website, abroaders.com. Happy Wednesday morning and welcome to another episode of the Abroaders Travel Podcast. I'm AJ Dunn here with Eric Paquette. Today we're going to talk about how to leverage massive consumer protections built into credit card agreements. We'll also be running through our stats on points earned in 2013 through credit card churning and how we're planning to spend those miles this year. Show notes can be found at abroaders.com slash benefits. Hey, how's it going, buddy? Not too shabby, man. Uh, in Mexico currently at the airport, though, so uh, going to have some issues with some background noise, it seems. Uh, it's a little good extra atmosphere. Here's some flight announcements coming up. A couple of quick updates. As you guys know, I'm in Salvador, Brazil. A lot of work so far here. Been heads down working on improving our booking service and working with the software development team on the Abroaders web application. Wanted to share a quick inspirational story with you guys. We've talked about this quite a bit off the air, and it's definitely worth sharing with all the listeners. So um, let's get inspired, man. Give us, uh, give us the weekly inspiration. So last week, we talked a little bit about long-term rental options on the podcast. I mentioned Brazil is still a bit of an outlier with respect to the presence of Airbnb. And so just a little background, I was looking for a place somewhere on the coast here in Salvador between the neighborhood of Pituba and Baja, which is a stretch of about 15 kilometers. And Airbnb has less than 100 listings if you're looking for a place on your own. If you limit the price down to under 1,000, which is about the max I was willing to spend, we're looking at 11 listings total. In comparison, local sites like Aluguel Temporada and Easy Cuarto have nearly 1,000 listings in the area I wanted to stay. And for those, the prices are anywhere from 300 to 700 US dollars for a one or two bedroom. So there's a massive difference. And here's the opportunity I wanted to share with you guys. The guy that I'm renting the apartment from, Paolo, bought this place for less than 65,000 US dollars a little over a year ago. And he divided this apartment into three different separate apartments. So he lives in one and rents the other two for somewhere around 1500 to 2000 US dollars per month. That means he's likely to be recouping his investment and living rent free in about three years. And obviously he could do it even faster if he weren't living in one of those three apartments for, by himself. So he told me there's very few entrepreneurs like him in Bahia. His places are almost always full and he's always got a bunch of extra requests coming in through Airbnb. So when he doesn't have space for someone, he refers that to one of his friends with an apartment to rent and takes a small commission for himself. The problem, he told me, is that he's only got a couple of reliable friends to pass leads to. He knows dozens of property owners, but they're all so lazy, they won't even return a phone call or an email, even if there's a renter ready to make a deposit. And so clearly this guy has carved out a really low friction business for himself. He lives in a beautiful city, one of the best neighborhoods, and his primary source of income takes less than 10 hours per week of active work. So that gives you a lot of extra time to work on other business ventures, other hustles. Um, what are your thoughts, man? I mean, sounds like a really good deal. Are there any potential hazards that we should be looking out for here? Yeah, I think so. I mean, like you said, an incredible opportunity if you can buy a place for a price that's you know very affordable, but for whatever reason the rent, the market just you know rent is pretty expensive. This stuff is especially in Brazil. Um, I would be very leery of any bureaucracy being a foreigner owning real estate. I know it's different in every country, but I can only imagine how much of a cluster it is. I mean, just getting your visa in Brazil is difficult, so I'd be really curious to know the actual details and paperwork you would need to do to technically own property. Um, and on top of that, I know that there's just a lot of nasty people out there that are looking to screw you. I stayed at a, a bed and breakfast in San Jose, Costa Rica, and this guy owned land now. He was a, He's an American and been living in Costa Rica for about 15 years now, but his first land deal, he got screwed, and some politician literally just changed paperwork on the deed of the land, and he um, lost like his news. huge, huge investment. Um, and uh, the final thing is you don't want to rely too much on a website like Airbnb to send you business because you you never know what's going to happen with that. Um, there are certain municipalities like San Francisco now. It's technically not even legal. So I think if you have a handful of ways to get people in the door and rent to, it sounds good to me, but I just want to look into the details about um, owning 
you know, real estate as a foreigner. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I think if we were going to get into this, you and I would probably uh, have somebody that we know and trust in Brazil that's a Brazilian citizen take this into their name. There's definitely some research that needs to take place before you can pull the trigger and purchase a property. Next, it's not necessarily always going to be the case that Airbnb is so uncompetitive here. So right now, he is one of a couple of listings, but it's very likely that people are going to catch on because Paolo is making way more money than other people that are renting just because he's using Airbnb and has access to a market of people that have a lot more money or are willing to spend a lot more money to have the simplicity and security of using the Airbnb system. There's also a more systemic issue here in Brazil that there are few services that effectively cater directly to English speakers. It's hard to buy stuff online bus tickets, recharging your mobile phone. So with respect to housing, I think it's possible to differentiate yourself to English speakers even as Airbnb gets more competitive here. So in other words, kind of a counterpoint, there may be a, a rise in the number of people using Airbnb, but at the end of the day, those people are still not native English speakers for the most part. And so using the Airbnb platform, I think it's still possible to differentiate yourself and I think you can still win that one. Another thing to consider though, is that this project definitely requires some hard work at the onset. Don't forget that Paolo had to actually divide his apartment into three separate ones and build some extra bathroom facilities to make them viable as standalone units. So there's both a time and a materials cost here, and you either need to know how to do this type of work or find someone who does. If you're new to Brazil, it's probably going to be hard to go out and buy the materials you need to build a bathroom in the new apartment you just purchased. So there's some other things you're going to want to look into getting some local help or unless you're just a master contractor and, and already have a lot of that skill set taken care of. Lastly, you need to make sure you get the right deal on the place you're buying. Lots of people are predicting a housing bubble bursting after the World Cup and the Olympics coming up in 2016. But that doesn't mean there aren't great values in the right neighborhood. All right, so we got a bunch of stuff to cover today. We're going to leave it there for now. Hopefully, one of you guys out there in the Abroaders community seizes that opportunity. If you are doing something similar, or maybe you found another market where there's a huge disequilibrium of housing prices or opportunities that are similar to what we were talking about today, we'd love to hear from you. Shoot us a note at support at abroaders.com. Moving on to the heart of the episode, we're going to be sharing four big benefits that credit card companies are offering you. It's included in your credit card agreement. All you have to do is know how to leverage them. Then we're going to run through the points that I was able to earn in 2013 through new credit card applications and by leveraging existing relationships with banks. Tracking your return on investment is a big part of travel hacking. So we'll be sharing the key details like how many miles I was able to earn, how much it costs to get them, and how much I had to spend to meet those spending requirements to get the bonuses. Let's get started. There are four major benefits that we're going to cover. First, dispute privileges, then travel insurance, then purchase protection, and then travel services, concierge, and complimentary memberships round out the fourth item. First benefit is the ability to dispute transactions. And we're going to go over three different reasons that most credit card issuers will accept as grounds for disputing a transaction. So the first reason that you might dispute a transaction is that you don't recognize it. This protection is often referred to as zero liability fraud policy. So it's pretty straightforward. If you didn't make a charge, you aren't responsible to pay for it. Your obligation is only to inform the credit card issuer as soon as you become aware of the problem. A couple of tips here. First of all, review your statement carefully at least twice a month. I do it every week. Mint is a free service that aggregates your online banking for all your credit cards. So you have everything in one place and you don't have to log into each bank's website individually. Foreign transactions often appear on your statement with weird names and sometimes in a foreign language. So if you wait until you know 20 or 30 or 40 transactions pile up, it can be really hard to go through and remember what's legitimate. So the next reason you can dispute a transaction is that you were overcharged. Maybe they got the amount wrong, or in some cases, maybe you were charged twice for the same transaction. 
This would also apply to a situation where you were supposed to receive a credit or refund, which the merchant failed to process, like if you made a return but never got your money back. The hardest of these to keep track of is when you were charged the wrong amount. The tip here is to always check the amount on the receipt at the time you make the purchase. Just make sure that it has the amount you expected to pay and you're good. I want to take a quick second and elaborate on why these errors are so common. So in Brazil and lots of other places I've traveled, most merchants enter the amount to charge you by hand rather than letting a computer enter that information after scanning a barcode. So you just have to be ready to correct human error. It's happened to me multiple times when it was very clear the person was not trying to rip me off. They just made a mistake entering the number. The third and final reason we're going to cover that you can dispute a transaction is extremely powerful. I've used this dozens of times and received a refund on every single occasion. Here it goes. You can dispute a purchase if the merchandise or service you paid for was not received or was not delivered as agreed upon. There is truly a ton of flexibility here. So let me give you a couple of examples of how I've used this in the past. My friend Andrew and I were traveling in Colombia in 2010, and we had just finished up our trip. We were about ready to move on to Brazil, but we were in the north of Colombia, and we had purchased a bus ticket from a place called Santa Marta, which is on the Caribbean coast of Colombia, all the way down to Bogota, where we were going to catch our international flight over to Salvador, Brazil. Now, we got on the bus, everything went fine, and we traveled for about four hours out of the eight-hour trip. And then we got word that the only bridge that was crossing a massive river to get us to the other side where we were going to continue our trip to Bogota, that bridge had been washed out, and there was no way to get to Bogota. So the bus company decided to take us back to where we started. It was a nightmare. We ended up traveling on a bus for eight hours just to get back to the exact same point. And to add insult to injury, when we got to the bus station, it was like 3 or 4 a.m., and nobody was there to give us a refund. And so the bus company said, like, look, the office is closed. You guys can come back tomorrow, and, you know, if the bridge is fixed, we can take you tomorrow, or you can ask for a refund, you know, tomorrow in the morning. But that was the last thing that we wanted to do. We had already paid for a cab to get there. We had already lost eight hours of our lives going nowhere. We had resolved to just take a flight the next day and just bite the bullet. And so the benefit here... Because the bus company didn't deliver that trip that I paid for, I was within my rights to dispute the transaction. And so instead of paying for another cab to get to the bus station to argue in Spanish with somebody about why I should get my money back, all I had to do was spend about two minutes on the phone with Capital One, explain what happened, and I saw credit for that on my account the next day. A second example of how I've used this, and this was recent, is... During Carnival, I went and purchased an Ethernet adapter. The new MacBook Pros don't have an Ethernet spot uh, to plug in to wired internet. And so I bought an adapter that was supposed to be able to receive an Ethernet cord and plug into the USB slot. Only problem is that when I got home and tried to use it, it didn't work at all. So, naturally, I went back to the mall where I bought it from, went back to the store, talked to the manager, and asked for a refund. And he said, sorry, there are no refunds. And of course, I argued with him, explained that the product he sold me was a piece of crap and it didn't work, but he wasn't sympathetic at all. He said that was their policy and it didn't matter. He thought it was working perfectly fine. It must be a problem with my computer. So rather than sit there and argue with someone in Portuguese who is clearly not going to help me, I just made that final offer and told him, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to dispute this with my credit card company, and they are going to take the money back from you, and they're going to give it to me. You have a choice. You can either have your merchandise and sell it to somebody else if you want to be a scumbag or send it back to the manufacturer to get it fixed, or you can refuse, and I'll take it with me and still get my money back. Well, he refused, and I called the credit card company the next day and got an automatic refund. Last example here. AJ and I, last year on our trip to Southeast Asia, booked a flight on AirAsia and the phone representative booked the flight on the wrong day. I got an email confirmation a few minutes after hanging up with the agent and saw that the date was wrong on our itinerary. So I called back immediately and said, look, the agent made a mistake. I asked her to book the 22nd, she booked the 30th. We need to change this flight. And the person I was talking to said, well, that's too bad. Purchases are final and uh, we're gonna have to charge you a $150 change fee. Well, we were gonna be traveling the next day. I didn't have time or energy to argue with them. 
So I just let them charge that $150 change fee and then called the credit card issuer and got the refund through them. Again, it worked. And this is a scenario where the credit card company probably didn't have to be on my side because there wasn't really any proof that I had told the phone agent that the trip was supposed to be on the 22nd. I could have easily been lying and just trying to get out of a change fee. And the point here is that the credit card company backed me up. They want to keep you happy. So as long as you're being reasonable, as long as you stay calm and friendly and make the report about what happened, they're almost always going to cover your back. They're a huge, huge enterprise. They've got thousands and thousands of lawyers on retainer that will go to bat and protect you. They're always going to try and keep you happy as long as you're being reasonable. The burden of proof is generally on the merchant, and it's a pretty high standard of proof. Before we move on to the next credit card benefit, a couple of quick notes on the dispute process. Each credit card issuer has slightly different procedures for handling disputes. You're going to need to contact your creditor directly using their website or the number on the back of your credit card for specific instructions. You'll normally get a provisional credit to your account immediately, so you don't have to pay the charge in question when the credit card company is busy investigating. Unless they get compelling evidence from the merchant that the charge was legitimate, that provisional credit that they issue you when you make the dispute will eventually become permanent. Last point on this, don't abuse the privilege. Amex, MasterCard, and Visa are Goliaths. They will go to bat with all their legal muscle on your behalf. Be honest and use the right to dispute only when you truly feel you've been wronged. Time to move on to the next credit card benefit, which is travel insurance. These are generally offered through Visa, MasterCard, or American Express directly, rather than through the bank that issues your card, like, for example, Chase, City, or Barclays. The tricky thing is that the level of coverage, the exclusions, and the details will vary from card to card. So, for example, if you've got a really high-end Visa signature, you're probably going to have a higher level of insurance coverage than you would have with an entry-level student-type credit card or a credit card that you don't have to have quite as good a credit to get a hold of. You should familiarize yourself with the protections that apply to your accounts, either by reading that obnoxiously long paper thing that comes with the card or calling customer service to ask about specific benefit. Time to get into the detail. The first benefit is lost or damaged luggage coverage. If your belongings are lost, stolen, damaged, something happens while traveling by air, rail, bus, you may be entitled to compensation. The next one is trip cancellation or interruption insurance. If you or your traveling companions are prevented from taking or continuing on a trip because of a sickness or an injury, you may be eligible for a refund of your ticket or other costs. I had a really good example of this last year at the conference in Bangkok. One of my close friends, Danny, came down with appendicitis and ended up in the hospital. He had purchased a non-refundable ticket for over $1,000 to travel home, and he wasn't able to make that flight because he was busy in the hospital recovering. All he had to do was call the credit card company, let him know that he had been in the hospital for appendicitis. They asked for some simple verification to send that hospital bill or some sort of information showing the dates, and they refunded that ticket to his credit card right away. Next, we've got hotel insurance for stolen items. If something is taken from your hotel room, your credit card company will likely cover the cost of replacing those stolen items. Lastly, we've got rental car insurance. If you use your credit card to pay for a rental car, you may be eligible for complimentary rental coverage that enables you to that will enable you to decline the more expensive insurance offered by the rental company. You need to know the details of this policy carefully. One thing to keep track of is whether it's primary or secondary coverage. Primary coverage means that your car insurance back home is not brought into the equation. So in other words, the credit card insurance, if it's primary, is positioning itself as the first line of defense, and any charges fall on them first. Secondary coverage means that you'll need to file a claim first with your regular insurance company, so whoever insures you when you're driving back home, and then the credit card company insurance will cover expenses that your primary coverage does not. So it's a big difference, and you definitely want to grab a card that has primary insurance and just keep track of which card that is. So, for example, my United Explorer card is one of the few cards that I have that offers primary coverage. I got a great sign-up bonus of 50,000 points, and I really don't use the card that much now that I've earned that bonus, 
but I do keep the card open just because every time I'm going to travel, I know that I can use that credit card. And with the exception of about three countries, which are all pretty much major war zones, I have primary rental car insurance. I can decline that $30 a day insurance that the rental car company is trying to sell me. And for free, my credit card insures me up to $100,000 on any vehicle that I'm renting. So it's a great benefit to know about. You should definitely look into that, figure out which cards have it. And if you don't have a card that has it, definitely check out our credit card offers. We'll point you in the right direction to get you set up with that United card or another one that has primary insurance. The third benefit we want to cover here is purchase protection. This means that you're protected against defects, damage, or theft for goods purchased with your card. Normally, the purchase protection lasts for 90 days and covers a broad range of events. The amount of coverage is generally capped at around $1,000 per item or per transaction, but I have a couple of cards that offer $10,000. Those are often business credit cards, but that can be extremely important if you purchase something more expensive, like a new laptop computer, camera, or something else that's worth more than a thousand bucks. I bought a new iPhone before heading down to Brazil with the intention of selling my old iPhone. And unfortunately, the new phone that I had was stolen out of my pocket in the middle of a massive crowd. And so I was able to take care of that right from Brazil. All I had to do, I called the number on the back of my card, got instructions from the credit card company on how to proceed, uh, they instructed me that I needed to file a police report within 48 hours and then just send them a copy of the receipt for the phone, the claim form that they emailed me, and a copy of the police report. So there were just three things. I took care of it all electronically, and I got a check for nearly $800 from the insurance company a few weeks later. They sent it to my U.S. address, which I had somebody grab that mail for me and send it, put the check in my bank account. But the 90-day protection covers almost anything. So Literally, when I was talking to them on the phone, I kind of asked them to go through what other things were protected besides theft. And the lady said, look, you could literally drop your phone off a building. You could blow it up. You could go for a swim in the ocean. All these things are protected. All you got to do is call and file a claim. Now, after 90 days, you're likely to have some sort of extended warranty protection that comes with purchase protection. Usually, they will double the amount of time on the manufacturer warranty, but it's only going to cover manufacturer type defects like the phone just stops working for no reason. A couple of tips here to be able to take advantage of that purchase protection. You need to keep copies of your receipts and you should do that electronically so that if you're stuck in a place like Brazil, you're not going to have to have somebody mail the receipt in for you or take a picture of it. You also want to consider timing purchases right before travel to max out the amount of time that your gadgets are covered. So in other words, you get that 90 day window you should buy the new computer or the new iPhone right before you leave the country. That's going to maximize the amount of time that you're 100% protected. All right, guys. So there's a couple of benefits that fall into our fourth and final category. The first one is travel assistance. And that could include things like pre-trip destination information or passport and immunization requirement. It could also include getting help with lost or stolen travel documents and luggage or getting referrals to attorneys or physicians, or getting help reaching out to local embassies or consulates. Call your credit card company, let them do the work. They've got a database that's gonna cover a bunch of that stuff. In general, travel assistance benefits are in effect if you're traveling more than 100 miles from home. If you're in a spot where you can't get internet access, you can go to a phone booth and call the toll-free number on the back of the card get directly connected to somebody at the credit card company and ask them to help. So don't be afraid to activate that travel assistance. I've used it a couple of times and it's really helpful. The next thing, which is a little bit more personal, is concierge services that can be offered with a bunch of different credit cards. Often I use these guys as a research assist. So maybe I ask them, hey, I'm looking for a hotel tonight. I need you to find me cheap options. And so I'll ask the concierge to email me three or five hotels in the area along with prices and phone numbers to book or links to book online. One thing that you should note is that concierge generally comes with business or personal cards that have higher annual fees. So check and see if it's included. It's not necessarily a reason in itself to get a new credit card. One last warning is that it can be pretty expensive. So while they do take a lot of the work out of it for you, they also are not necessarily interested in saving you money. They're working with a group of partners. If you're interested in more ideas or more creative ways that you can use concierge, 
you should check out a post by Tim Ferriss that we're going to link up in the show notes. It's pretty funny. He has these concierge people running circles. So it's worth a read if you want a good laugh. The last benefit here is complimentary memberships and services. Amex Platinum, for example, offers access to more than 600 airport lounges. The Barclays Arrival Card, which has, by the way, a much more reasonable fee than the Amex, offers a free TripIt Pro subscription, which is super valuable. All right, Abroaders, so before signing off today, I want to do a quick rundown of the results from my credit card churning in 2013. One of the most important things you can do as a travel hacker is keep track of how many points you're earning, how you're earning those points, and how much it's costing you to do so. That's the only real way that you can know that you're getting a valid return on investment for the time and money that you're putting into travel hacking. For me, there's hands down no question that I'm getting huge value from the points I'm earning. So next week, we're going to go through and actually talk to you about how much money that AJ and I have saved from awards we've booked using the points we've earned. But today, to keep it short, I'm just going to give you a quick recap of what I earned in 2013 through this date, March 25th in 2014. So grand total, I was able to pull in 563,000 miles, and that was across eight different frequent flyer programs. The total cost in terms of annual fees was $837. And that also required me to spend $33,000 on those credit cards. So those would be things like hitting those minimum spending requirements. Now, keep in mind, it's possible to spend $12,000 a year just by using Amazon payments. And that's a hack that we talk about a lot. And so if you've got questions or are looking to set that up, get in contact with us and we'll help you out there. But the bottom line is that I ended up paying 837 bucks for just over a half a million points. And those points I'm planning to turn in 2014 into a ton of really cheap travel. So we'll get into more on this in the next episode. We're well overdue for a big time ROI episode where we talk through the nuts and bolts of how much we're earning by churning and how we're using those points to get free travel around the world. We'd love to hear from you guys. Please send us your comments and questions to eric or aj at abroaders.com. Like always, feeling extremely lucky to be able to spend Wednesday mornings with all you abroaders out there. This week's International Jam is inspired by AJ being in Mexico. Had to get something with a little bit of Spanish out there. This guy is actually a French rapper. His name is MC Solan. The track is Hasta la Vista. There are two verses in Spanish and one in French. It's one of my all-time favorites for training language. I hope you guys enjoy. We'll see you guys next week, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks for being with us. Wherever you are, travel safe. See you next time. Hasta siempre, que viva la revolución Rapero número uno, el grito en la canción Soy en el papel de la líder como Fidel Castro Tengo el micrófono, amigo, cuidado Solar, soy al mismo tiempo serie Star Estrella La gente de India me llama Star Pasta rap de Barcelona, de Costa Rica Alianza, tercer mundo, Sudamérica A mí me gustaba la chica llamada Raquel Tengo la voz, la fuerza, estilo y papel Si te gusta, vas a bailar como Ibiza Soy como el sol, sol, hijo de África Hey, brothers, don't be shy. The best part of our day is connecting with you. Send your show feedback, comments, or questions to Eric or AJ at abroaders.com. You can also leave us an audio note right on the website and maybe even get yourself featured on the next episode of the Abroaders podcast. J'étais livreur de pizza, près de la Sienda ou la Chica, du nom d'Esmeralda faisait la fiesta. Comme par hasard, elle me commande une panne chorizo. J'ai compris le complot quando la fille me dit te quiero. Amigo, dans le barrio, on se pavane et sec, sec, six jours sur sept. Et qui la patrice de tête Mais ça n'a pas plu à certains pistolero. Bagarre hors tel Valera, de vraie tête de Villero. Expulsé de la ville, tel un sans pape, seul sans barrier et isolé, tel un gâteau sans pape. Quand je pense à toi, Rachel, Esmeralda, j'en ai la gorge serrée, mais bon, j'ai des Valdas.